morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review here with us. We are studying this week, Mission to the Unreached, Part 2, and we are studying this morning, Send Her Away. But before we go into our discussion, we'll have our prayer by Elder Ellis and our memory text by Dr. Ellis. Father, we pray. Father in heaven, again, we want to thank you for waking us up to see this morning. Thank you for watching over us over the past hours of the night. We thank you, O God, that we are in our right minds. And so now we come to study your word. We thank you for being with us. You have said we are two or three are gathered. You are in the midst. And even though we are distance apart, you are omnipotent omnipresent and therefore you can still be in our midst so please forgive us where we have sinned and come short of your glory holy spirit please quicken our minds enlighten us teach us your word and help us to rightly divide your word of truth may we glean lessons that would help us to make us stronger in following you in jesus name amen, amen. Amen. Our memory text is taken from Matthew chapter 15, reading verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Amen. So we're looking at a very powerful miracle, we would call it, from our memory text this morning. But before we decide for our memory text, we're going to ask Dr. Ellis, we're going to begin with Elder Ellis and then Dr. Ellis, what is the context of our memory text? And then you can tell us what are some insights you get from that specific text this morning. The context of our memory text, what we see here is that Jesus was confronted or he was requested of a woman who was not a Jew to heal her daughter. And so what we see was that Jesus did not readily, as it were, accede to her request. And Jesus used some strange words to her to tell her, look, man, I wasn't sent to you Gentiles, you know, I was sent to the house of Israel. And so the lady, she persisted that Jesus should heal her daughter. She said that, look, even though you didn't come to us, you know, and we are treated like dogs, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the children's table, from the master's table. And, you know, it was a strange sort of setting. But Jesus wanted to teach his disciples a lesson. It's not that Jesus was not compassionate. And so Jesus moved from teaching them a lesson to showing them something that this lady, she was persistent. And even though she was looked at as one who was unregenerate, unrepentant, someone who should be unreached, you know, um, yet she had faith, the faith of Israel in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus turned to her with our memory text. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour so persistence work out there are some of us who believe that oh jesus you know jesus hears he understands everything and we should just ask one time and leave it at that and it's not that jesus does not understand when we ask for anything prayer does not move the hand of jesus as it were Prayer is designed to help us to grow so that our faith in Jesus Christ can grow. Jesus knows everything. Even before we ask, Jesus knows. And so we see that here, that the disciples saw something 
different in the way Jesus treated this situation, and it helped to break down their prejudice. Good morning, everyone, all our listening audience. Based on the background Elder Ellis gave, I will just continue by saying that I am always amazed at how Jesus can expose us to ourselves. Now, Jesus took his disciples on the border of a hidden nation in order to spread the gospel, in order to expose them to more than just preaching to themselves or persons belonging to them. And he directly moved into that direction where that woman was because he sees everything, he knows everything, and he really wanted to use that experience as a great object lesson for his disciples. When he never answered her, his disciples believed, well, okay, she was bothering them because they were so steep in their prejudice. And he turned and said, you know, he was just come to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. But when she worshipped him, you know, Peter, when he was going to Jesus and he sank and Jesus saved him from going under in the wave, he worshipped Jesus after he was saved after he was delivered, but before she received her blessings, before she received deliverance, the Bible said she worshipped him and asking him for, uh, for deliverance for her child. So first of all, she understood that she was not worthy because she knows she is not of the house of Israel, but she asked a request for someone else, and she believed that he is able to grant that request. And because of that, he knew everything. He responded to her with the fact that, oh, you know, great is thy faith. So he said, oh, woman, great is your faith. He said to Peter, who was his disciple, oh, ye of little faith. So we are seeing here where Jesus is comparing and contrasting the hidden nations that not, are not supposed to know him, that they are exercising more faith than those who are supposed to know him and who are journeying with him. So I think it is incredible that Jesus is so patient that he knows that his disciples are the ones to spread the gospel. And therefore, as much as their faith was not as strong as a woman in desperation for her child, yet he was exposing them so that they can develop that love and that faith and break down the walls of prejudices so that they can be able to minister to those that are not of their kind, like Jews or, or of their nation. We're going to go right into our question. And our first question is just for Elder Ellis. Just for Elder Ellis. What prevented God's people from bringing hope of the Messiah to such foreign countries as Tyre and Sidon? The lesson tells us that nationalism, pride, and prejudices, you can go on and on, bias, uh, profiling, all sorts of things, would have caused God's people, who were given, as it were, the oracles to proclaim it to the unreached, to the Greek, to the Gentiles, and those who were, as it were, outside the household of faith. This would have created some barrier for them not to carry uh, the message to the seeming unrich. This matter of nationalism and pride and prejudice, uh, one could be steeped in it because sometimes we are given certain things and rather than use it for God's purpose, what 
we have been given it for, we tend to feel privileged to the extent that, you know, we are so privileged that this thing should be held on to, it should be hoarded. And so rather than sharing what God had given his people to share to the world, they did not understand God's purpose. They did not understand the big plan, the big picture. God's plan is really that salvation should come to everyone. Jesus, from the Garden of Eden, uh, and when we look at the book of Ephesians and Galatians, we see that this was a God's a miraculous plan that everyone ever since Adam's sin, salvation should be free to everyone, not a privileged group. But the Jews, they did look at it in that way. And so that would have prevented them pride. They felt good. Now, one may want to ask ourselves the question, this happened back then. Is it is the same thing happening now, today? Because we consider ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists to be spiritual Jews, spiritual Israelites. And God has given us a powerful message, the three angels' message, so that we should proclaim to the world those who we see as Gentiles, those who we see as not belonging as it were to the household of faith. You know, we should carry this message. But yet sometimes we, because of pride, you know, we feel so privileged, we do not reach out with it. And Jesus came to show that everyone we should reach up. We, we are saved to serve. We have a message to proclaim, and that message is to call those who we believe are in spiritual Babylon, to call them out of Babylon. So Jesus came, according to the Apostle Paul, to break down the wall of separation. So there is no more any Jew, any Gentile, there is no Greek, nor no Scythian, no, no anything. All should be taught of the word. All of us are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we do not have a lease or a license on anyone but to show forth the word of God. Jesus is coming for a prepared people and we are expected not only to look for the coming of Jesus, but to hasten the coming of Jesus. And we are reminded that Jesus said, look, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to urge remotest bound for a witness. We are witnesses and we should preach the gospel as a witness, whether it is to those who are not of our nationality, those who are not of our same religious and ethnic group, those who are not of our same language or what have you, God has given us a message to carry to everyone. And he's depending on us. We're going to go into our text and we'll turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Elder Ellis will read verses 9 to 16, and Dr. Ellis will read 28, 34, and 35. And then we'll come back to our question. It says, On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making uh, preparation, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky open up, and an object like a great sheep coming down, Lord, by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds, of the air, a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. 
But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never holy and unclean. Again, the voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. He said to them, that is verse 28, He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Amen. So our question here is for both our um, panelists, our guests. We'll begin with Elder Ellis and then Dr. Ellis will come. How do you, and this is our, our, your personal opinion, how do you summarize the lesson taught here by the Holy Spirit? What we see from the lesson is an object lesson, as it were, where God used metaphors, used analogies to bring out certain points. Now, the Gentiles, uh, the Greeks, the whatever, those who are not of the household of Israel or the Jew are not of the household of Jews, uh, as they were, would consider a soul of faith, they were looked at as unclean. They were looked at as being unreachable. They were looked at as being outside of the household of faith, and therefore they should not be mingled with. According to the, to, to the text, it says that they were unclean. And so Peter was shown vividly in this vision while he was in a trance that God was asking him to go and kill and eat but the interpretation really was not to literally ingest these nondescript beasts, uh, animals, unclean animals. If you were to look at Leviticus 11, uh, the Jews should not partake of those things. Those things never chew the cud and, and, and have clip hoofs and so on. So according to the ceremonial stuff, they should not be, be tangled with. The bottom line was, and to crumb it off, Peter was hungry. This thing come to him when he was hungry. I like the way the author put it, that he was exposed to a buffet of stuff and asked to eat. What God was trying to tell him, according to the scripture, was that do not call anybody unholy or unclean. No human being should be looked at with such prejudice that you should not reach out to, to them. In summary, what this was another area in which the barrier, the prejudice should be broken down. God had to reveal it to him. And I liked what Amos says in Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. God wants to save us so badly that he goes he after us so that the things that we do not even see that would hinder our salvation, he reveals it to us so that we can come face to face with this. Sometimes we think that we are good. The Bible tells us, hey, look, we must take heed. If we think we stand, take heed lest we fall. And so here it is where God was showing Peter that 
the Gentiles were not outside of the realms of salvation. And he has a task to perform in ensuring that they also embrace salvation. For Christ died not only for the Jews, but he died for everyone. God knows us, us intimately. And for those of us whom he has called to serve, he wants to insert it, ensure that we are prepared. Now, the Jews were steeped in their prejudice and all the other areas of judgment of others that they were not willing or did not have the capacity to entertain or even to be able to accept another religion or another nationality or another faith or anything like that. It was not long after Jesus exposed his disciples to the mother asking for help, whom Matthew called a Canaanite, Canaanite woman, that Peter had this vision. Now, first he had the exposure with Jesus, and now he is on a rooftop and he is having an exposure from the master, from Jesus himself, from God, setting down the sheet to say, nothing that I have cleansed is common or unclean. It had to take a revelation like that for Peter to draw the object lesson so that he could have understood that persons are there to be, to, to be saved and God's intention is to save every single person. When he was finished with the three times refusing to eat, the wrapping came to the door and he clearly understood. That is the other thing about God. When he gives us a vision, when he gives us an impression, when he gives us an inspiration, he has this way of making like a panoramic understanding of what it really means. And Peter clearly understood what that vision meant. So when the rapping came and he had to go to foreign places, he was able to say beyond the shadow of a doubt that he understands that when God say, and we looked at it in verse 28, it says, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So, after that vision, Peter understood clearly what God was talking about. And therefore, he understood that he had a message, not only for his Jewish brethren, but for the nation at large, for the world, because whom God has called. And he also said it. He said, when a person does good, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So Peter understood clearly that as long as a person is seeking God, as long as a person is surrendered, God is going to reach out to meet them, to edify them, to be able to enlighten them and to save them. And we have seen it in many examples. We look at the Ethiopian eunuch. We look at several other examples, Zacchaeus and everyone else. When they are seeking after God, he reaches out and he saves them. He brings the salvation to their homes. Amen. So this question is for... Dr. Ellis, what lessons did the disciples learn from this field trip that related also to Peter's vision? And 
How can we apply these to our lives today and to Christ's last day call to his mission to the cities? It's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it, it is really, really difficult for us to escape. And sometimes we might say to ourselves, I'm not prejudiced. I can reach anyone and I can speak with anyone. As I was looking through this lesson, the thought came to me of a person who sits by the courts bank and near the bank right there in Linden. And he begs. And whenever I have Jace with me, Jace would ensure that I give him some kind of money to give to this man. And I would say to myself, all these strong people, they just like to sit there and beg. While I was sitting doing the lesson, the thought came to me. And so Jace would say, Grandma, you think he is hungry? Or you think we should go and beg, give him some, carry him to get a bath or something like that? And I would say, Jace, he is fine. But the lesson came to me today. I was reading and I said, you know, we are all so prejudiced. I don't know his story. Maybe I need to know his story because I've never seen him drinking or smoking or doing any of those things sitting there. And we are all, we all kind of judge people based on how they look or their situation or whatever. We have to be impressed. We put a doll in somebody's hand or whatever else the case might be. And I'm asking the Lord to truly show me myself and help me to understand the, the power of being prejudiced, the power of marginalized people because they don't look like me or smell like me or attend the same social gathering that I attend. So these disciples, they had a really rude awakening and still they did not really get it all together at one time but they begin to understand. And this was all throughout Jesus's ministry because when he met the woman at the well where they were not accustomed to someone speaking to a woman, a man speaking to a woman like that and especially a foreign woman and Jesus was there ministering to her and many other instances where Jesus met, when we look at the gentleman with his servant ill and came to Jesus, the soldier, and say, you know, I have authority over many people, and all you have to do is say the word. And Jesus was there showing his disciples on many occasions how to reach out to persons that are not of their kind. And the other thing, if you look at all those examples, it always says, Jesus had compassion on them. When he saw the woman who was going with her son to bury her son, and he ro rose the son from the dead, he said, the Bible says he had compassion. So Jesus showed a lot of compassion. It did not matter what your nationality was, your creed, your culture, Jesus showed love and compassion and that's the lesson he wants all of us to have all of us to learn that we show compassion and love irrespective of how that person looks or who that person is and i'm asking god to please help me to see beyond what i'm seeing on the surface that i can have a heart of compassion I pride myself a lot of times to think I had compassion until I was looking at the story and I remember the gentleman by the bank and I realized, okay, fine, I need to step it up and do something better than this. So we all have to consider, and you know, it's hard for us to, to think we are not prejudiced, but when we reach this real life situation and the Holy Spirit brings it to our mind, how we reacted towards certain people, then we know we are also steep in prejudice and we have got to ask God for compassion. Amen, amen. So we're going to look at Galatians. I'm going to read it for, for you. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. And our question here is, what should this teach us about how hard it can be to be purged of the prejudices 
we have been taught since childhood. So, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to a face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. A question again, what should this teach us about how hard it can be to be purged of the prejudices that we have been taught since childhood? We begin with Dr. Ellis this time, and then Elder Ellis will wrap up this question for us. The thought just came to me of sometimes we are on the phone and someone might say something to us, but our response would be maybe with a little bit of bias or prejudice. And I'm thinking that when we look at how hard it is for us to really get out of this whole matter of hypocrisy, that we don't even know we are hypocrites. I think that it's a lot of work where God is so patient and his Holy Spirit working in our lives that we can really understand every opportunity we have with a human being, whether it is face-to-face, -face, telephone, Zoom, however it is, that it's an opportunity for their salvation. And it's also an opportunity for us doing mission, doing ministry. So it's many times and quite a few times that we would find ourselves in a situation where, and to my mind, we don't even realize it. I'm saying we because I'm not excluded, realize that we have been prejudiced in the situation that we are talking about or that we are discussing, and we are not bringing God-fearing light to the conversation. So whether we are seeing people, whether we are witnessing, whether we are having a conversation, whether we are having a prayer session, or whatever the case might be, or seeing a human being on the road or wherever, so I'm asking God to help us to really understand our thinking. And when our thinking is going in a direction of, judge, of judging or separation, that we ask God to help us to understand our thinking, because that can also lead others astray. Barnabas was a strong guy, but because those folks coming down from James, Peter just began to disassociate himself from the Gentiles. All the time he was doing pretty fine. He was eating and drinking and having a good time with them. But now James sent down a couple big shots from conference head office, and he decides, no, I can't make these persons of this circumcision see me associating with the Gentiles, which really and truly Paul had no bones about calling him a hypocrite. And uh, that is something that we need to look within ourselves to see how much of hypocrisy is within all of us who are calling ourselves Christian and that we ask God to take away those prejudices from our hearts so that we can be more like him and we can be clear in our thinking that like Jesus, when he goes to work, when he went to wash Peter's feet and Peter said, no, Lord, I can't allow you to do it. Peter, he said, well, then you have no part with me. Peter said, well, wash my hand, head all over. He said, no, your feet alone is good. You're clean. That Jesus can look at us and say, you're clean. So, you know, can Jesus look at us and say, we're clean? It's only the Holy Spirit can do his work within our lives to clean us up and to make us be clean that we do not have 
bias and partiality and prejudice against anyone. You know, when I look at the lesson, ever so often we like to point fingers. And good Seventh-day Adventists as we are, we seem to always be pointing fingers. But as the old people would say, when you point one finger, four fingers are looking back at you. And I think this is a lesson that Jesus, even though we tend to focus on the Gentiles and so on, we as Christians ought to look at ourselves. Look at the prejudices that even the disciples and the apostles displayed. And we see it in the church also. In the church, sad to say, we see so many Pharisees. And we have to look at ourselves that we also are not Pharisaical because we see all the errors of the of the brethren and we see all that those on the outside who are not of the household of faith, the errors and so on. But what Jesus was pointing out to his disciples that when you read what Mrs. White says, even in his response to the Syrophoenician woman who went to ask for a daughter's healing, Jesus started from the reaction that the disciples would have given. And so they thought, okay, this man was in sync with us, send her away. I mean, I'm not come to deal with the Gentiles. So that they could have also recognized their situation because Jesus wanted to teach them a lesson. You see, salvation is for all of us, and we have never arrived. And when we listen to the Apostle Paul in some of his writings, he tells you clearly that, look, he has not arrived. So we as Christians ought to always be taking introspection into our lives. When we are, the Holy Spirit convicts us of certain things. Sometimes we try to be the Holy Spirit to tell people how to do. And Jesus also say, look first, take that log that is out of your own eyes before you can see to clear the speck in somebody else's eyes. I'm just trying to make it real because each of us might have a big thing in our eye, but yet we are trying to see the little dust in somebody else's eyes. When we see these things, we ought to thank God for his grace and his mercy that keeps pursuing us. Even pointing these things out, as, out to us so that we could recognize how far we are from the kingdom and be compassionate, empathize with people because we are in the same situation. Sometimes we don't realize it. And so the question is asked now, what from the text in Galatians, what should this teach us about how hard it can be to be purged of prejudice? When we are steep in prejudice, in fact, the, the psychologist says, look, you have a child, what the child learns from age one to seven it's not easy to try to get that out of their system. They are programmed. And to deprogram them, it is not easy. We would have been steeped in prejudices and we come up with all kinds of traditions and so on. And even though we accept Jesus Christ, it does not go away easily. Two weeks ago, we looked at the lesson of Naaman. Naaman was cleansed of leprosy. And we see the manifestation of Jesus Christ here in that Naaman was made clean. However, that did not mean that Naaman and the lesson tell us not because we accept Jesus Christ, it means that readily we put away everything. There are these deep-seated prejudices that would raise their ugly head often, and it's a struggle 
the battle that we have, the warfare that we have, and that's why we are encouraged to put on the whole arm of God. God wants his character to be reproduced in us. He wants to teach us love. So it doesn't matter how much prophecy we know. It doesn't matter how much this we know and how much that we know. Not even, it doesn't matter how much faith we have. And that is what the Apostle Paul is telling us in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. If we lack love, it profits us nothing. And therefore, we ought to ask that the Holy Spirit indwells within us so that we could be taught, we could have the fruit of the Spirit so that we can prejudice and all these things could be as it were eradicated because we would have a heart of love and compassion that which Jesus displays. So how hard it is? Sometimes it's like a lifetime struggle, but God can help us. The Holy Spirit can help us to overcome any prejudice, any nationalistic view, any sort of profiling and so on anything that is unlike jesus christ amen so we are we're out of time for the morning but we have to do our takeaway what is your takeaway from our lesson this morning my takeaway is that jesus is so patient that he understands our love for him yet he understands from where we came and therefore, with kindness and patience, when we are able to appreciate and when we are able to understand, he exposes us to ourselves or he exposes those situations to us. And because we would have been ready to appreciate what he is showing us, we are really ready to make that change. So I thank God for helping us with all the prejudices that we have in our lives. And we have not, once we were born in this world, we have not escaped from being touched with some form of hypocrisy in some way or other, or some prejudice. And I am thanking God for his grace and his mercy to help us to see ourselves and to give us the willingness to work at it and to be changed by his grace. My takeaway seemed to be similar to Dr. Ellis. I thought she was reading into, the, into my head with our takeaway. God so wants to save us that he is exposing us to these lessons so that we can see ourselves that we should see everyone as a candidate for the kingdom. Love and compassion and so on are attributes of the Spirit. And my takeaway is daily, I need to be bathed. I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit so that I can live the life that comes and I can go on God's mission and lead others or point others to the safe harbor, which is Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. And that has brought us to the end of our lesson this morning. We're so glad that you, our panelists, guests, could have been with us this morning. And we, look, we are grateful that our viewers could have been with us as well. And we look forward to seeing them tomorrow morning as we discuss the topic that is phrased as a question, Faith on Earth. So share the link with a family, share the link with a friend, and join us as we continue to study together.